That's not what he said. That's not what he said. Getting accurate information from scripture is so important because if not, you can mislead people. It can actually lead people to a crisis of faith. Misleading people can cause people to not have an authentic relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're going to quote the scripture, make sure you get it right. So we've been on, uh, in a series entitled, That's Not What He Said. And this morning, you're going to have to put your seatbelts on because it's going to be a little rough. Uh, um, but I, I do want you to um, have your notepad paper ready because you're going to have to write a little bit. I'm not going to read so much that it feels like you're in, in school, but I need to read enough to kind of get, I need to read enough. <laughs> I need to read enough. <laughs> I need to read enough to make sure that um, you understand the context of what's going on. Thank you all for coming out to prayer too. Friday night was incredible. All of you that came to pray. Uh, all right, so we're gonna read Jeremiah chapter number 29. Yeah, yeah. You ain't gonna say that when I'm finished. Yeah, yeah. Jeremiah 29. Let's go with verse 11. Amen. And let's start off with verse 10 instead. Man, let's go one verse above it. Jeremiah 29, verse 10. Mm -hmm. Yes, Lord. This is what the Lord says. You will be in Babylon for 70 years. But then I will come and do you all good things I have promised, and I will bring you home again. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. In those days when you pray, I will listen. Come on, keep reading. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will end your captivity and restore your fortunes. I will gather you out of the nations where I sent you and will bring you home again to your own land. You claim that the Lord has raised up prophets, prophets for you in Babylon, but this is what the Lord says about the king who sits on David's throne and all those who are still living here in Jerusalem, your relatives who are not exiled to Babylon. This is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. I will send, this is what God says after the verse we all loved. I will send war. I will send famine. I will send a disease upon them and make them like bad figs to rotten to eat. Yes, I will pursue them with war, famine, disease, and I will scatter them around the world. In every nation where I send them, I will make them an object of damnation, horror, contempt, and mockery. For they refuse to listen to me, though I have spoken to them repeatedly through the prophets I sent. And you who are in exile have not listened either to the Lord. Therefore, listen to the message from the Lord, all you captives there in Babylon. This is what the Lord of Heaven's army say. And then he goes on and tells them. Now, this is why I read this, because it is important that you understand context is important. What we like to do is we like to pick a verse that speaks to us without reading the whole thing. And in this particular text, I want to give you what was, what was happening was that there was a prophet who got up there. Jeremiah spoke these words to the Jews who had been living under the domination of the Egyptians and the Babylonian Empire. And you can only imagine how it is to be picked up off your land, shipped off, and forced into basically a type of bondage. And all of a sudden, God sees this prophet called Haniah, who was two chapters before, who prophesied to them that in two years, you're going to come out. Well, God comes back and kills the prophet for lying. Then God says in Jeremiah 29, he says, I know they told you you're going to stay for two years, but you're going to stay for 70 years. 
but I know the thoughts that I have towards you. Y'all ain't working with me today. Thoughts of peace and not an expectation. So this is what happens. Let me modernize and contemporize it for you. You in prison. You done got picked up, put in the jail cell. And then you know how you sitting in there like, hey man, how long you in here for? Man, I'm in here for 30 years. Man, 30 years? How long you in here for? Man, I'm in here for 50 years. And your attorney comes and visits you, and they visit you behind a little glass, and they say, hey man, um, I just want to let you know uh, I'm going to get you off. You're going to get off in two years. I got you. Two years, you out of this joint. And you're like, oh man, it's terrible, man. So then you go back to your cell, you eat your cornbread, and you're like, man, I only got two years in this joint, and I'm out of here. You stand before the judge, and the judge says, hey, my friend, how you doing? You're like, good, judge. Uh, I, I, I know I only got two years of good behavior. I'll be able to get off. And the judge says, two years? You got 70 years. But I know the thoughts that I have towards you. They're thoughts of peace. To bring you to an expectant, which simply means like, no, you're going to do time in here. But I'm going to preserve you while you're in here. That even though you're going to go through this, I'm going to be with you through it. So when we read that verse and we quote that verse, we need to quote it in context. That does not mean that God doesn't have plans for us. That simply means this that sometimes the plans that we have for ourselves are not the plans God has for us. Let me read my intro, which is my smart portion of the scripture, of the sermon. This series, that's not what he said, is to help deconstruct and reconstruct statements or misinterpretations that we oftentimes say or have heard. And if we examine carefully, they become part of our belief system, which eventually becomes a part of our behavior system. It is definitely not an attempt to rob scripture of the ability to be active and living, which means that the stories that we read in scripture in context can give me a personal word of application that applies to my situation. And it doesn't dismiss, and I would not rob you of the ability to read scripture and get personal devotion or edification from it. Some phrases aren't in scripture, but one can easily determine that they are meaningful, such as God doesn't say in scripture to an individual, I love you. But we can derive from John 3.16 that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that God loves us. Cleanliness is next to godliness. That's not a scripture, but we can read Leviticus and realize that being clean is an attribute of godliness. This week, I would like to cover a phrase which I believe can be true, but not automatic. Someone say true, but not automatic. I've heard people say it in singing. I've heard people preach it. I've heard conversations about it. And it's this simple phrase, which I think is very dangerous. What God has for me is for me. I will affirm God definitely has things assigned for us, but to assume that they are automatic allows entitlement, procrastination, and a sense of pride. Let's explore in context a verse everyone loves as well as we tell students at graduation, we tell our friends, which is the verse that is absolutely true but must be viewed in its entirety. Now here's the thing that we see is that we read and we say it a lot that what God has for me, it is for me. Which kind of helps us form this theological construct which says, because God has this for me, can't nobody take it. Because God has this for me, I can take my time to get there because it's for me. You know, if this cereal is yours and you know it's yours, you don't have to worry about anybody taking it because you know it's what? It's yours. But what if I told you what God has for you is for you, but if he sees that you won't do with it what you're supposed to do, God will take what's for you and give it to somebody else. Come on, let me give you a Bible. Matthew 25 verse 14. It is a parable of talents. 
it is the, ma the master writing, Jesus writing in the red. He says this in Matthew 25. There was a man, I'm reading and paraphrasing, there was a man who had five talents, a man who had two talents, a man who had one talent. The man who had five talents multiplied and did what he needed to do. The man who had two talents multiplied, did what he needed to do. The one that had one talent started looking at what he had and said, oh my goodness, the guy that has five is doing so much better than me. I cannot do anything with this one talent. And then the master comes back and he goes to examine what they all have. And he looks at the guy with five and he says, great, you've done a great job. I'm going to give you five more. Then the guy with two, he says, man, you've done a great job. I'm going to give you two more. The guy with one, he says, well, master, I didn't do anything with what you gave me. I knew you to be a hard man. And the master looks at him and says, well, why did you just take the one talent that I gave you? You could have invested it and got something back from it, and you did nothing with it. I want you to give me your one, and I'm going to give it to the guy that has ten, because they that know how to steward things well get more of what they steward. So what if God has five talents for you, but you're so competitious, you're looking at everybody else's talent, you won't work yours. Is God supposed to let you die with your talent? Or is he supposed to take the talent and give it to someone who will do work with it? See, we have an entitlement mentality because a lot of us are mad at God because God doesn't work the way we thought he should work. The God that we created in our minds made us and here's the thing God will not overrule our decision if you want to settle in Lodabar Mephibosheth if you want to settle in a place that's not best for you God will invite you to come up but if you want to stay there God will not wait and waste time for individuals who feel like God is obligated to work with them let me give you another one. Elijah says to God, he says, God, I, I don't know what you're talking about, player. I'm the best prophet you got. I'm the only one. What you have for me is for me, and you can't use nobody else. And God looks at him and says, son, I got 7,000 that have not even bowed their knees before Baal, which simply means the moment you decide not to do what you're supposed to do, I will find somebody else who's already doing what they're supposed to do. I will awaken them from their sleep. I will awaken them from their destiny. And I will tell them, I know you weren't planning on having this, but I want you to know that I'm going to give you more because I thought I could trust somebody else but because I couldn't trust them I now got to give it to you because my word will not return unto me void but it will accomplish what I sent it to do can I ask you a question what has God promised you that you thought was for you and didn't do nothing with and God gave it to somebody else because if you don't steward your spouse well Y'all ain't talking to me this morning. If you don't steward your job well, you won't have a job. If you won't steward your position well, you won't have a position. And God may have given you the job, but if you keep showing up late, you won't keep the job. And God may have given you the position, but if you got a nasty attitude in the position, even though God had a plan for your life, God will use someone else in spite of you, despite the fact that he wanted to use you. To assume that God has to use me means that God is stuck with me. It's an entitlement attitude. And that's what we breed when we tell, girl, what, what, you don't need to, if that house, that house is yours, what God has for you is for you. Well, if you don't fill out a mortgage application, if you don't fill out a credit app, it don't matter how much you drive around, name it and claim it, it will not be yours because faith without works is dead. And there's a lot of things that God wants us to have, but we can't have it because our faith is dead. And God says, I know the thoughts that I have towards you. Now, now, can I ask y'all an honest question again? Maybe there's some people that we told them that God has a plan for them, a purpose for their life, and maybe it was to keep them in 70 years and not get them out two years. 
And I know that's the popular thing to fill the church is to prophesy that God's going to do it in two years. But what if God doesn't do it in two? What if he says you got to wait 70 just so we can do it together? Now, I'm not saying I like it. I'm not saying I appreciate it. But I am saying this God or genie that we got, that God wants me to have a cattle upon the thought. Maybe God might say the only thing I want you to have is a three-bedroom house and that's all you're ever going to have and that's all it's ever going to be. I know they're trying to tell you, no, you're going to be a millionaire because God got a plan for you. What if God knows a million would ruin your life? See, we got to realize that God... Oh, y'all ready for this one? Okay. God wants to teach the children of Israel that you need to trust in me. I, I know some of you have this philosophy, which is unique. God is in control of everything. He's omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent, all-powerful. Some of us have this weird type language we start using now. You know, the universe, the, the universe... The, the universe, I, I feel the universe is giving off these, the universe is this, this, you know, I just talk to the universe and, and I talk to the universe. I, I talk to the universe. You put, yeah, I talk to the universe and the universe made me feel, the universe is telling me, okay, what? Well, okay, fine. Okay, okay, cool. If we want to have that conversation, let's have a philosophical conversation. Why would I talk to something that was created by someone that's greater than the universe? Why would I worship a universe when the God of gods created the universe? And why would I give all of my effort and energy into a universe when God created a universe? God is so big, he created the earth and said, let me put eight more planets out there just for decoration. I'm going to make sure that they don't even touch the sun. I'm going to make sure that they don't move too much. And you might be wondering, why did God create it? I just created it for my glory. I didn't do it for no other reason. Some of you are worshiping, but you're worshiping a small God. If you worship God, as much as you worship the universe and energy maybe your life would be so much better and maybe your life would go so much farther here it is Matthew 14 let me go Matthew 14 Matthew 14 here it is Matthew 14 y'all ready Matthew 14 um, let me tell you this story because it's true so when, when I first when Karen and I first got married we we had a house that was in Apopka. It was a 3-2 in Errol Estates. And um, God told me, this is a house you should buy. And I knew it was God. Everything that was around it was God. But we got kind of afraid because we started asking people about the plans God had for us. And at that time, people weren't buying houses like they are now. You know? so. We, we were, we, we, um, it was 3-2, it was $110,000, right on the golf course. And, and all of a sudden, we, 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 we started asking people, like, what do you think? They're like, oh, man, shit, man, you talking about $110,000? Can you imagine if you get foreclosed on? If you lose your job, what you gonna do? And those were all true. But the other side of the coin was, could you imagine if you bought that house? Could you imagine the legacy that you would leave for your children? Could you imagine the income that you would create for yourself? All of these things. And we let fear make us walk away from what we knew God had. Someone else bought that house a, a few weeks after. They enjoying that house, I'm sure. Probably sold it and made a whole bunch of money. But I missed out and Karen and I missed out on what God had for us because we were scared at God's invitation. Because God invites everybody, but if you don't take the invitation, God ain't going to just close the invitation. He's going to invite somebody else. So what God had for me, someone else was living in. Now, now this verse is, it is a true statement that when God has something in mind for you and you're doing and obeying God and following God, God will make sure that whatever is yours will get to you somehow, some way. But the attitude or the assumption that, no, I ain't got to do that. What God has for me, shoot, it's for me. Here it is, Matthew 14, 22 through 33. And I'm going to paraphrase because my clock is ticking. I'm not going to assume you read this before. I'm going to tell you the story because I don't know if you've read the Bible before. 
Matthew 14, it's also written in the Gospel of Luke. It's also written in the Gospel of Mark. It's the third watch of the night, which is about 3 to 4 a.m., which is my favorite time to pray because I believe things happen around that time. If you study scripture, you see a lot of activity happening at 3 a.m. and 4 a.m. And you find out that a lot of people, when you talk to them, they say, man, I just, I just couldn't go to sleep. I just woke up at 3 a.m. And sometimes it's God waking you up because God is trying to talk to you and tell you something deeper about yourself that he couldn't tell you because Instagram and Facebook had your attention. And so here it is. So God is, is the third, third, third watch of the night. All of a sudden, the 12 are in the boat. They're all professionals. They're used to fishing. They're used to being on the sea. And then all of a sudden, Jesus says, you know what, I'm going to walk, read the scripture. Jesus says, I'm going to walk on the water to go to the other side. Jesus wasn't going to catch a boat. He was going to just walk on the water to the other side. He looks at his disciples and he sees that they are in trouble. And he says, let me go help them. He walks out there and all of them are scared because they are in trouble, but they don't recognize the form of help that God is sending to them. Oh, y'all missed that. Because when you're in trouble, God will send you help. It may not be the form that you think, and they scream out, it's a ghost. And all of a sudden, they're walking, and they're thinking to themselves, well, how are we going to make it? How are we going to survive? And it's, it even, it's even more interesting that God saw their struggle, even though they did not know he saw him. God saw them struggling to get to the other side because they were trying to get to the other side but every time they try to get there the winds and the seas would fight their progress I don't know about you but have you ever been in a season where you're trying to get to the other side and it just seems like every time you try to get forward there's a storm that keeps on hurting your progress there's a wind there's a y'all preaching with me now there's a wind there's a wave there's always something that's trying to stop your progress there's always something that's trying to impede your destiny impede where you're going that's what you call warfare warfare is when it recognizes you're close to going to the other side it comes up it rages up it starts to start trouble the water is starting to get trouble why because the waters recognize that you're going somewhere and maybe warfare good to see you Zach warfare is a sign that you're going somewhere warfare is a sign that you're moving somewhere if you don't have no warfare maybe you ain't going nowhere but when you have warfare that means I'm going somewhere I'm treaded somewhere when you see things start coming against you when you made up in your mind I'm going back to school I'm going to get my degree I'm, I'm going to reconcile with that person I'm going to forgive when you see those things come against against you that's a sign that you're going somewhere but here's what the disciples did they try to keep rowing against what was affecting them there is a moment in your life you got to realize I can't do this in my own strength I can't do this in my own power I need the help of someone greater than myself and I gotta look for God I gotta look for God and you might be saying well what do you mean pastor I'm saying you gotta look for God you gotta find God wherever you can find them you gotta look Look for God. When trouble is in your life, look for God. When storms are in your life, look for God. Don't try to row against it. Don't try to fix it on your own. Look for God. Don't try to do seven steps on your own. Look for God because God will bring you out if you look for him. So here it is. God sees the disciples and he invites one of them, but it's an invitation to all of them, that if it's you, bid me to come. And notice what God says in the text through Jesus. He says this, if you want to walk, come. The invitation wasn't to Peter. The invitation was to all of them. The invitation wasn't to one, it was to all 12 of them. And he says, whichever one of you has enough faith to take my invitation, 
you will experience what I'm experiencing. Even though the invitation is for all of you, but if only one of you takes it, I'll honor the one. If two of you takes it, I'll honor the two. If three of you takes it, I'll honor the three. Because what I found out is there's a lot of people in church who hear about God, who pray for God, and when God gives them the invitation they've been praying about, they build up evidence to why they shouldn't do what they've been praying about. I know I'm going to lose some of you, but let me rattle some of you. You've been praying that God would give you a job, and now all of a sudden you got an opportunity to apply for another job, and you won't go apply. Why do? It? Why pray if you, God's going to give you the answer, and you're not going to step out on the answer you prayed for? You may sink, you may fall, but listen, if God gave you the invitation, I can promise you one thing, you're not going to fall. If God gave you the command, you're not going to go under. You're, I don't care how bad the economy is. If God told you to buy a house, I'm not looking at the Forbes report. I'm not looking at the stock report. My God owns a cattle upon a thousand hills. He is the ruler and creator of all things. If you let fear grip you, you'll never do anything in your life. And what God has for you will be for somebody else. And I need to tell you, there's an invitation not to look at the White House, but look at God's house. There's an invitation to look at God. Don't be so fixed on what you see that you don't see what you need to see. God says, I want want you to come and what Peter does is Peter starts he says God will allow you to settle to whatever level you whatever level you align yourself with invitation is not always immediate you know what many of us do when God calls you and tells you to come you say things like this I'm not ready yet you know what that means? It's what I call, what, what's my definition that I wrote here? It, it's, 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 it's procrastination. Procrastination, y'all, I want you to see this definition. It is the arrogant assumption that God owes you more time. Y'all ain't hear what I said. Procrastination is the arrogant assumption that God owes you more time. God doesn't owe us any time. The time to do it is now. The time to do it is now. The time to obey God is not tomorrow. It's somebody shout in your mouth, say now. Somebody say it on your TV screen, type it in, say now. Somebody say it with authority, somebody say now. The time to obey God is now. It's not next week. It's not next year. And stop being mad at the one who decided to obey God when we all had the same instruction. We all got the same word, but only one of us decided to use the word. It's one thing to have all these notes in your notepad, all these highlights in your notebook, but at some point, you got to stop highlighting and start letting your life be the highlight. You got to stop highlighting, stop writing, all the verses and all the sermons and all the leadership podcasts you heard and all the self-development podcasts you heard and say God I've learned a lot it's time for me to use what I've learned and the invitation is not just for one it is for all come unto me all oh, you who are heavy laden and if you don't come it's not God's fault it's your fault and a lot of times we keep making excuses on why we're not doing it now You got more evidence against yourself than anybody. Well, I'm not this, and, and you know they know me as that, and they know about my this, and they heard about my that, and I'm not comfortable doing this, and I'm not used to doing that, and I'm not familiar with that. And God's like, oh my God, can I find somebody that will just say yes without giving me all their resume or why they can? You got one thing on your resume that gives you enough. God called you. And as long as God called you, that's more than enough. That's more than enough. That's everything you need is the fact that God called you. If God said come, I'm not checking with you 11 because you don't believe what you heard. We all heard the same thing, but we hear it differently. I can imagine the other 11 in the boat. Why Peter decided to go out there? 
You know, scripture doesn't just hide things. God used a person with the worst reputation to walk out there. If he would have sent John the Beloved, I could have understood it because John the Beloved has the greatest heart towards Jesus. He's always by Jesus. He's always by Jesus' breath, always laying in Jesus' arms and trying to be close to him, not in a, in a derogatory way, but that's just who he was. He just had this affection towards God. But God used Peter. One of the worst examples. So that when you and I read it, the application that we should read within the context is that if God would use this person who has a resume that is not good, who has a resume that should be like, out of all people, God don't use him, then certainly God can use me to do it. about resources resources follow your obedience you will never have enough resources at the beginning you will always find the resources when God trusts that you can obey I just, I don't know it is. I just got this crazy feeling to just do this if it's crazy first check with God obey him you know when I when we first started this church and we started moving people would say this guy's why y'all following him he is crazy he's just moving he put all that money in the building and then boom it's only crazy until you see the fruit you have to learn not just hear him trust what you hear get over your fear we all are afraid every week you're going to be afraid because God's never going to let you get so comfortable where you can do it in your own power if you can do it in your own power you don't have a dream you have a hobby hobbies can be done on your own dreams take God Stop telling yourself, what God has for me. God's like, I had a lot of stuff for you, but I had to give it to other people because I couldn't get you to believe yourself that what I had for you was for you. <laughs> Let me tell you the story we're done. I promise. I was on my balcony and it connects to my son's room. And he was playing his wrestlers. My youngest son, not DJ. My wife had him. I just participated. <laughs> and uh, he was playing his wrestlers. And I knocked on the window door. And he looked. Kind of peeped through the, trying to look through the blinds, couldn't figure out who it was. I knocked again. That boy took off and started running downstairs. I laughed so hard, I cried. I mean, he was so scared. But you know what was interesting? He ran towards help. He ran downstairs like a track star to find his mama because he heard a knock on the window. Children teach us a lot about what we're supposed to do. That at first, he wanted to check to make sure what he heard was what he heard. After he heard what he heard and, and confirmed what he heard, he didn't have enough courage to do it on his own. 
when he recognized I don't have enough strength to address what I just heard, I'm going to run and get somebody who has enough authority, someone who has enough courage to help me be courageous because I'm afraid of what I heard, even though I know it could be somebody that I know. And you know what's crazy? This is the part that's going to make you run, but you can't run because we're all social distancing. The knock was not a stranger. The knock was not an enemy. The knock was his father trying to get his attention to let him know I see you and what was supposed to be a help to him ended up being fear to him and he ran and got help baby I don't care if you gotta run and get help make sure you get help from the right help and let that help bring you to your father who knocked on the door as an invitation to you to come out and play I was just inviting you to come play with your father. I wanted you to see how beautiful it was out here, son. I want you to see the sunset with your daddy. I want you to see the sun, how it rises and how it sets. I want you to see how it lits between the trees. I want you to see the moon about to come out. But you got afraid of my knock. My knock wasn't to make you afraid. My knock was encouraging you to come. My knock was, it was inconvenient, I know. You were playing. You weren't ready for the knock. But that's how God oftentimes works. He knocks when you're not ready. He knocks when you're not prepared. He knocks when you're doing your own thing I know I disturbed your peace but I knew I couldn't get your attention unless I disturbed it and I had to disturb your peace to let you know that there is another opportunity outside what knock you running from what knock you scared of It's not a stranger. It's not a ghost. It's your father disturbing your peace so that you can see the thoughts that I have for you, the plans that I have for you. Their plans to prosper you, their plans to bring you to an expected end. But you can't receive that if you run from it. Bow your heads, let's pray. Holy Spirit, thank you. For the word of the Lord. We were in captivity thinking only two years, but it was 70 years. But even in captivity, you still let them know, I don't care how bad your captivity is, I still could have a plan for you in a bad season. <sighs> that even you got even though you got the worst news of your life I can give you the best news for your season so Holy Spirit use our storms because they teach us Use our fears because they show us where we stop believing. Somewhere along the lines of the pandemic, somewhere along the lines of viruses and skepticism, we started running from your knock. God, help me to trust you. to trust you even when I feel like running away because I don't understand the first step of trust is giving him your heart maybe you're in this sacred place or in your sacred sanctuary at home you have not made peace with him this time, he's not knocking to give you a plan. He's knocking to give you a purpose. 
this time it says, I'm knocking at the door of your heart. Would you not open it? No, I'm not going to open. I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. That's okay. But let's reason for a moment. there's a painting there has to be a painter if there's a design there has to be a designer if there's a child there has to be a parent if you die and you're right you lose nothing if you die and you're wrong, you lose everything. This is not about a church. This is not about what the church does and why you can't connect with church. This is about connecting to God, which is bigger than church. It's bigger than the two songs, the sermon, the tithe and offering. It's greater than that. It's about the eternity of your soul. It's bigger than the programs of your church or your church hurt experience. I want to invite you not to a perfect relationship with Jesus, but a loving one. How, how could someone stand up here and tell you about their experience with breast cancer and still have faith in God? seen them. I don't see air, but I know it's there. You need a friend that's going to walk with you. No, it doesn't mean that problems won't happen, but, but how, how come people, people, life is filled with trials and tribulations. That's what Matthew 5 says. But God will walk with you and he'll grow you. Each and every day, he'll grow you. You might be Peter. You might be the one or Peter or, or Petra or, or Susie or whatever. Let God work with your heart. That's all he's asking you for is your heart. Everything else he'll deal with later. And you may be mad at God and you might be so upset. That's why you stop following him. I feel like God did me wrong. We all feel that way. Can I give you an example to bring this home? As a kid, have you ever felt your parents didn't know what they were talking about? You felt like they were wrong in the way that they did things. And when you got older, you started to realize, even though I didn't agree, I understand now. It's just what the Father says. He says, some things you're not going to understand in this earth, you'll understand it later. It's okay, God is not afraid of your disappointment in him. Don't let that stop you from connecting to a God that will grow you deeper. So what we're going to do is we're going to pray. We're going we're gonna to pray. I'm going to pray with you. And in your own words, you're going to invite him into your heart. Now, once you invite him into your heart, just don't let him stay there without telling anybody. That's why you need a community of faith. Thursday nights, we have this thing called Faith Talk. It's online. You just go on a Kingdom Church page at 7 o'clock and go online. And maybe you're in the sanctuary or maybe you're online. We have a system to where we can connect with you. If you want to make Jesus Lord of your life, all you need to do is one, pray with us, but we want to follow up with you to ensure that your walk with God is strong and secure. So we made it real easy. All you need to do is text this word because we figure that's the easiest way people communicate now. It's just text this word Jesus to 407 449 8884 text the word Jesus, where you're watching online or in the sanctuary, text the word Jesus 407-449-8884 text the word Jesus 407-449-8884 once you do that, you should get a link sent back to you, that's our way to connect with you we're going to follow up with you this week, you will hear a phone call from us this week because we want to walk with you now I want to pray with you, a prayer doesn't change anything when you come down this altar, if you were in the sanctuary and came down the altar, or if you're here and you're saying I want to get right with God if you come down the altar, you're still going to have the same desires that you had when you came here. But over time, God will start developing a new appetite. 
I know you're thinking right now, man, I got a lot of bills, I got a lot of issues, I got a lot of stuff going on in my life, I need God to fix this, I need God to fix that. Listen, when you're in the middle of the ocean and you're drowning, you could care less about all those other things. You don't need those things fixed, you need a savior. And right now, you may have a lot of things going on, but right now, you don't need those things fixed. You need to be saved. So, Father, I pray for my brother and my sister in the sanctuary, in this sacred space, or watching us online, or watching this again later on tonight or during the week, or maybe even a year from now, that they'd make peace with you by saying, Jesus, you died for me. And on the third day, you resurrected for my sins. My sins put you to the cross. Even though I wasn't there, you died for my sins, past, present, and future. And so I accept this eternal sacrifice, this atonement that was done for me. Despite the fact that I don't deserve it and despite the fact that I am the one that put you there. God, I, I couldn't do enough good things to get into heaven. The only thing that is the prerequisite to get into heaven is that I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Now, God, I'm going to need your help to lead this life. And because you're so wise, you decide to send me the helper called the Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, you're the third person of the Godhead. You're there to help lead me. When Jesus was on the earth, he walked with the disciples. Now that Jesus has ascended, he left us the Holy Spirit to help us because he's not physically walking the earth. So Holy Spirit, teach me the things that my father, my mother, my pastor may have not ever taught me so that I might become better. God, I want to be different. And I know the difference starts with me adding you in my life and on my team. Come into my heart, rule, reign, and abide, and I will give you my final breath in everything that I have. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. This series is so important. That's not what he said. It helps us fall in love with Jesus actually says and what scripture actually says. So we don't build a relationship with a Jesus that we have created in our mind that's not in the scripture. That's not what he said.